Okay, uh, oh, you better uh, hold on to yourself. And I mean there, because this is a R-rated uh, podcast. Gilbert Gottfried is my guest and my friend. And we've been friends a long time. We've been friends since uh, our early 20s. And we laugh at what you're not supposed to laugh at. We laugh at heinous things. Of course, he would take that and get the word anus out of it. So if you're under 15 or 16, I would suggest your mom or dad uh, intervene. I just don't think you need to hear this because it's not the proper way to talk. Um, If you have morals. And if you are offended easily by uh, bad language occasionally or something incredibly irreverent and wrong, it's not meant to be wrong and hurt anybody. It's meant because there's so much horrible stuff in the world. This is how Gilbert Gottfried and how I deal with things in many ways is to think or say, not think, but say not, you don't think when you do this, say the worst thing you can. And that diffuses the terribleness of the moment. And we sure are going through a lot of terrible stuff right now. And so this is how we cope. And so I'm going to be connecting with him in just a second. And so what you're going to want to do is, uh, I hope, is rate, review, subscribe, download, follow it on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash Bob Saget. That's my name. And, uh, and, 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 you know, subscribe or follow, depending on how you get your podcast. Here we go. Please welcome. And kids, get out of the room uh, or take the headset off. Gilbert Gottfried. You seem very animated and excited to see me. <laughs> How you doing? How's it going there in the New York City? Oh, it, it's uh, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I no, I don't know. The whole world is falling apart, isn't it? Oh, you heard as well. I didn't know if yeah, you knew. Yeah, yeah, it was on TV. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's some kind of a virus is going around. I, I heard there, there yeah. was there was an onslaught of prop comics and <laughs> and mimes. Um, but, but I don't know. I do music in my stand up, but I at this point I feel like it soothes people. What what do you do to soothe uh, people? I walk out of the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, other than Vegas, uh, where do you find ventriloquists? Well, they, they, I guess at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach. Yeah. Well, you know, there's still some great people that do it. And, and you know, I'm at the point now, where, and I, I've always been there anyway. Anyone that entertains people, I, I shouldn't be sarcastically making fun of. It's ridiculous. They're making no. people happy. Yeah, no, I'm not putting down venture. I, I think mean, you were, and I no, think this will be the I, sa- this is the soundbite. No, no, fuck you. <laughs> I was not putting down. Don't talk. He- don't talk Hebrew to me. <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, there was Paul Winchell and Jerry Mahoney. Right. Uh there was uh, Willie Tyler. Than me. Willie yeah. Tyler and Lester was Lester? A, is a fr- is a yeah. friend. I was going to say they were my friends. Yeah, um, he was on my podcast. Willie he's Tyler. wonderful. He's wonderful, and yeah. you know, um, you look how great Jeff Dunham is. I mean, it's a, he's a phenomenon. But um, see, that's what I said. It's in Las Vegas. How come you don't see him on? Well, you know, there's no variety shows anymore. No, David Strassman, very funny. David had the 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 his his dummy would uh, be. Uh, auto animated. He had it remote controlled, so it came alive. Um, and, you ca- you can't follow that. And, the, Ed, Edgar Bergen. Oh, Jay Johnson is who I was thinking of. Oh, J- yeah, Jay Johnson, um, who and, was char- charming. And yes, Ron Lucas. Edgar Bergen, yes, is. Yeah, um, he was known as the greatest ventriloquist, and he would move his lips like crazy when he talked. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Albert Brooks did that once on the Tonight Show, where he, uh, I believe, he had a ventriloquist dummy, and 
I think uh, the dummy drank the water while he smoked, I believe. <laughs> and the water's just pouring out of the dummy. It was just... <laughs> So you got Groucho over your shoulder. Is that your favorite comedian of all oh, time? One of them. See, who, who, I like I like Groucho. I uh, when he started coming back to TV after he hadn't been around for a while, and he would show up on like Dick Cavett. Right. And by now he didn't look like Groucho anymore, and uh, he had none of the energy in it, and it was always like. Well, you know, we used to work in Fordsville houses, <laughs> and these were not actual houses. A house was a place where someone lived. In my day, they called it a house. <laughs> and he had the little little beanie on, the little beret. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sometimes he'd have golf balls on yeah, with that clown would be the, faces. So he had a gag. Yeah. That was old old Groucho. I remember that. Um, you Bet Your Life was his big comeback that m- reestablished him. Yeah. but And then he was still Groucho back then. Yeah. I think you, I, it, you, when I look at someone like you, not to compare you to Groucho, but you probably are the same height. Um, at one point, he was your age. Um, so you have a lot in common. I, I think I'm the same height as the Three Stooges. All of them. They they look they look uh, really small. They were. I I met Larry when I was 14 years old. Um, he came to my uh, high school and spoke, and then I went up to him and he told me I could visit him at the Motion Picture Country House and Hospital in Woodland Hills, and I couldn't believe he could still put that many words together. That's a long. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to visit him like four times. My mother drove me because I, I didn't have my license yet. And I would show him eight millimeter movies of the Three Stooges, but they had subtitles because I didn't have a sound projector. And they didn't have even UHF at the hospital. So he couldn't watch. And it was on every day back then. And, and it was 1971, 72, 3, I don't know. And he couldn't watch himself on TV. And he just he just complained how Mo beat the shit out of him, and and so they had titles. So would it go nyuk nyuk nyuk? <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, and, I the yes, everything they said was transcribed. So I and, I do think there's a lot of come here you, yeah, d- dot dot dot, and I think and, nyuk 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 was there. It didn't say wow. sound effects. It I remember. Finding that funny, I have it somewhere. But if I run an eight millimeter film through a projector, I think it'll just shred. I yeah, doesn't, that, don't they? Well, those uh, those like some of them. You open up the can and they go on fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have eight millimeter stuff? No, no. I I remember like friends of mine had it, and it's like, yeah, that stuff. Weird stuff would happen with eight millimeters. Yeah, it was like chemicals. They would go on fire, or they'd melt and turn into like some re- weird acidy goo. Yes, which is how what happens when I ejaculate. <laughs> By the way, this is probably not for kids. This particular episode. Um, where are your kids right now? So- Sometimes I ejaculate on rolls of eight millimeter. I Are you you're, so flames shoot out of your? <laughs> flames shoot out of my dick. Yes. Oh my god, that's so nice. That's so that you was could, an old. That you, was an old Tony Bennett song. Flames shoot out of my dick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He used to sing that after "I'll Be Around." Um, <laughs> did. did you it, with flame shoot out of your dick? Could you do welding, spot welding? <laughs> like if my door was coming apart at the hinge, you could just walk up to it and with your penis and just See, and weld it. Not to be confused with the Jerry Vale hit. No, Jerry Vale version was pure sexual. Yeah, his, his was. I be spark, he, his was sparks. Come out of my cock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, my 
my I remember he wrote my cock has a heart. <laughs> and it was just it was love. It was a love song. It was you know Yeah. And grown and, men would cry when yeah. they were seeing that. When when don't they these days? Yeah. So you look you look really good now. People are most people are listening to this. Yes. Um and you, as you know, have a voice that is highly recognizable. Yes. Have you ever considered doing sleep tapes? <laughs> yes. Relax. Relax. Everything's nice. Think of birds flying around your head. You know what else there's not around? Much like a uh, ventriloquist. Right. There are millions of people who do impressions, but out-and-out out impressionists, other than Vegas, you don't see on TV anymore. That the, uh, uh, you know, like, the um, imagine if your uh, waiter was James Cagney. <laughs> it might go something like this, and they turn around and muss up their hair. And uh, You would think that entertainment genre of comedy is gone but a lot of people you'll watch talk shows and you'll watch comedians break from one person to another you know it well it's like i i always liked when it's like the impressionist couldn't do the impression so they would do a character that that act you know like they go imagine if your waiter was al pacino like he was in scarface uh, yeah. <laughs> and then they do the lines from Scarface. Yeah, there, yes. there is, yeah, say hello to and, my little friend, and then it's his penis. And then there were those times with those impressions that just there's an unspoken agreement that that actor sounds like that, but he really doesn't. Like everyone, like people will do John Travolta. But they're all doing John Travolta from Welcome Back, Carter. Right. They're not doing uh, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. So right. it's like when they do a John Travolta, it's like, oh, uh, uh, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> or Grease. Systematic. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. They're really doing Dice's John Travolta. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I'll if I see Kevin Pollack on a, a talk show and he does Chris Walken, he does them even though they've you know it's everything's produced, but he still does them reluctantly, which is always charming when someone says you know you do a great when there you know four hundred people do Chris Walken probably a lot more, but he's he's an actor so you know and Kevin's an old friend. You're friends with Kevin, right? Oh yes, yeah. Because is it because of the height thing? <laughs> well, that's why I was friends with Billy Barty all those years. Oh, I actually worked with him. He ran between my legs at a corporate show, and <laughs> and then they we had a show all set up, and they fired us all. and And it was a guy named Murray Becker who booked us. Remember Murray? I the name I yeah. He was in New York. Yeah. You would see him at Catch. So let let's back up a minute. Let's pretend that was the second segment. Of a 19-segment show, because I don't think this thing's ending. Um, but I, I know that you want to uh, take a nap. What do you do around this time of day? Uh, oh, God. Well, normally I might be outside somewhere. Now does, it's does like... Dara just ask you to leave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you go on the patio? Yeah. Well, it's not a real patio. Oh, it's a fake patio. Yeah, fake patio I have. That's nice. Do you yeah. have, just uh, non sequitur, do you have, what's that sound? Was that you or is there some kind of movement in the was house? Was that a ding? No, it was a scratch. It sounded like oh, corrugated cardboard. I, oh, my God. That means there's good sound here. I was scratching the the arm I, uh, the armrest you were scratching your balls admit it <laughs> i was yes and my balls are very dry why so do you they make do you, that scratching why do you think your balls are dry just be honest sometimes birds <laughs> land on them and they pick <laughs> they pick the flesh of your balls they pick the flesh <laughs> 
the flesh of my balls. No, is this I be- think Robert Goulet saying the flesh of my balls. Birds peck at the flesh of my balls. I remember that. Originally, it was in Camelot, <laughs> and they took it out. Now, when you're on the patio, is that when your pants are down and your balls are out? Is that when the birds land? Yes, yes. <laughs> and they all start squawking, telling all the other birds that my balls are out. And then the other birds all show up on your yes, uh, yes. On, on your balls. All different, even species that were extinct <laughs> from years ago. Like a pterodactyl, like yes, a giant? Yes, yes, and they have those really long beaks. Right, but so they could can... kill you, but they don't? They just peck at your skin of your balls? Yes, yes. And when they fly away, they go, oh, shit, we could have killed them. <laughs> and all we got was this, this ball skin that's very dry. And then they have to go get water. That's why <laughs> dinosaurs are extinct now. Because they, they ate human made men's balls? They ate, uh, they ate my balls. I'm not old. <laughs> I feel that old. No, you're not old. I think you're a tiny bit older than me. Um, I'm 64. How old are you? I'm uh, 87. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, before I do these, I tape my skin back. <laughs> they, they do have that. They have like these, these, a lot of these celebrities use tape. I don't where, think anymore. I don't think oh, they, yeah. they do. No, I don't. Maybe they used to. They used to, and we saw it in movies. I remember there was a great facelift of uh, Kath- Kathleen Helmond uh, in Brazil, the Terry oh, Gilliam yes, movie. Oh, yes, yes. That was like the best rubber face facelift statement of how far people will go to stretch their skin. See, I, I think in the future, maybe even the not distant future, but in the future, well, it will be the distant future, uh, they'll find a way that people will hit 20 and not age anymore after that. They'll be alive, but they will never look older than 20. And I think they'll be people like, you know, 80 years old will look like they're 20. So there won't be, because the whole facelift and Botox, it doesn't work. So what method will they have that keeps you 20 is the question. If I knew that, I would create it, and I'd be world famous. You don't look a day over. Um, you don't look a day over. <laughs> <laughs> You've never looked back at the day. You've never looked a day over. <laughs> when this day is done, do you think you'll remember that you did my podcast? I'm trying to forget it now. <laughs> I, in my head, as I'm talking, I'm going, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. <laughs> so there's voices in your head. Yes. What, what, what do the voices in your head say? Uh, they Besides, say, I'm not doing this. Uh, sometimes they'll scream out at me in the middle of the night. Get those birds back on your uh, balls. <laughs> So back in the day in the 50s, 40s in movies, they'd call a guy a bird brain. Three Stooges, you bird brain. Now, today, you would say bird balls. Yeah. (laughs) Because your balls are being attacked. If if you were in the, if Alfred Hitchcock was redoing the birds, would you decide to beg to have a part in it where while Tippi Hedren's in the phone booth and they're attacking her, then they cut to you just laying on the ground with your pants down and, <laughs> and there's like 50 birds pecking at your dry skin balls. Yeah, I that well, that's a Christmas song. <laughs> 50 birds pecking at your dry skin balls. Who sang that? Jerry Vale? <laughs> That might have been uh, Jack Jones. I think it was Rosemary Clooney. <laughs> she had a big hit with <laughs> Oh, man. I hope George Clooney's not listening to this, because that's his aunt, you know. <laughs> I know. Oh, so he would know the song you're saying. What? He would know the name of the song that you mentioned. Yeah, he would, he would can, start singing it. Now, can either of us remember the name of that song? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, if I'm not, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, it was birds <laughs> picking at your dry skin balls. <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah, that was. <laughs> I like it because there's no city in it. You know, <laughs> you know, it, in Chattanooga or in Kansas City, anything like that. You know, it's just it's flat out just happening. So it could be well, anywhere. When Frank Sinatra did a cover version, <laughs> <laughs> he sang. <laughs> <laughs> Birds pecking at your dry skin balls in New York, New York. <laughs> well, that's, so that's what you're doing. That's what you did right before this, before you came on this podcast. You were outside and that was happening to you. Yes, that was happening. Do you put uh, seeds on your balls? Some people would have stopped this line of questioning. But this is our relationship, is we could do it. I'm holding a mug from Bumping Mics that they gave oh, us for free. They, and I bet you have the same one because we take swag. We take the I stuff. I love that, swag. I know you do. We, I saw your documentary. And if people have not seen this documentary. It's which called is, Gilbert. How did they come up with the title? Uh, very, I'm still trying to figure that one out. It should have been Gilbert with the dry skin balls. <laughs> That birds I, peck at in yeah. New York. <laughs> New York. I dream of Gilbert with the dry skin balls. I think because the network now it's on the podcast, you need to register that. I as think Burl Lives sung that one. Yeah, in between his uh, anti-Semitic Christmas rant. He he hated the Jews, yeah. Well, you know, it's a good time of year because he's not alone now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Burl Ives, <laughs> I remember, on a Christmas, on a Christmas special, <laughs> one time said, uh, he said, I'm a little gray frog sitting on the water, a little gray frog, I hate the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, rec I don't recall that. I bet yeah, you. He, he shoehorned it into a perfectly <laughs> nice folk song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would go down this road more, but this is one that... I, I would go down more, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you would, but you, as you get a little older, does your neck hurt? Uh, yes. Yes. That's why you don't go down as much? Yeah, and, and my dentures fall out. <laughs> you don't have dentures. I actually no. know that. No. Because I've been in your mouth. Oh, now I, I've got that. Uh, oh, Jesus. Why do you have circus music on your phone as your answer? Yeah. Who was I, that? Uh, that? That was um, uh, uh, well, that was John Stamos. Oh, that's very I'm, good. I'm talking, I'm talking to everyone from Full House today. That's nice. That'll make a lot of people really scared. <laughs> now, speaking of people who yeah. do... Uh, outdated impressions. What what's his name from uh, Dave Coulier. Coulier? Yeah, is he still doing Bullwinkle? Um, he does. He has. But I actually had him on this podcast, and he was he is one of the funniest people I know. Uh, when you hang with him, I, he would have you on the floor mainly because he wants to peck at your dry skin balls. <laughs> But the truth is, like I did this uh, Richard Pryor movie, Critical Condition, and Richard wouldn't do the TV-friendly version. Dave was the choice to do Richard's voice. And, and they, he, they really he, wanted the, 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 the comedian to be a, a black actor uh, to do Richard's voice, but they just said Dave just did it the best. And I think Dave also did it when they ran Blue Collar on TV, which that, is also Richard Pryor and... Uh, you, you might, and is that Harvey Keitel? Harvey Keitel, yes. He might have. I'll, I'll ask. I know he did more than one um, with Rich, of Richard's voice, but he also did, for Mork and Mindy, he did Robin's voice for the cartoon. Oh. Robin said, you know, I, I, don't, I can't do Robin. You can, because you knew Robin, and I knew Robin, and, you know... 
It's hard to bring up Robin and does not get sad, not want to fuck around for a minute. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's funny, though, but when he died, the first impression everyone got, the, not impression, no, the first thought was like, oh, the sad clown. And uh, then when we word got out what he was suffering with, it's like uh, it, it was a whole different story. He was, uh, I think by now, what shape would he have been in if he, if he was still alive? Well, having had a lot of friends and loved ones with mental health issues in my life, I, I, I don't know, but I know that they would have hopefully saved him from himself. But then he had a deteriorating condition. So uh, I, don't, I don't know. But I know from people very close to him that told me that we know that it wasn't him that did that. Um, and if someone especially someone as vital and, and amazing and energy more than anybody we've ever known, you know, insane amount yes. of energy. Oh, yeah. And then to go to nothing. I mean, I think he would have ended up in a, I, I don't know, but I, I mean, I, I've known, I had a sister that wound up in a solarium because it just didn't work anymore. But his condition was multifaceted tragic. Um, the- the thing I remember best about Robin is he, I, I was about to go on at the improv in New York. And then Robin walks in, and, and he was still on Mork and Mindy at the time. So, so they said, oh, oh, Robin, uh, you'll, you'll go on next. And uh, Robin said, uh, well, I have some friends in the audience and I'd like them to see Gilbert first. Wow. And Yeah, and he let me go on before. Do you remember, you've been very gracious um, and did my Sclerdema Research Foundation benefit at Caroline's in New York, and I believe it was y- you, uh, I was hosting as always, and you were performing, and it was Robin and was it Jimmy Fallon? Jimmy Fallon was there, yeah. A- and Robin and you. And I believe you went on last, didn't you? I think so. Because I'm, yes, because I was standing with Robin and Jimmy and we were screaming. We were laughing so hard because he was, um, boy, it's so hard. He, and he did the benefit like seven times. Um, and he looked up to people that had paved the way is how he would always look at it. And you're an, an anomaly. <laughs> 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 and it didn't matter what you were saying. You just had to go, oh, man, and that's it. We're just... We're, <laughs> We're ready. We know something's going to happen to that man. <laughs> it's not going to be good. A woman goes in. Okay. I don't know. It's not going to be good for this woman. I don't, I don't think it's going to end up well. But he adored you. And you were on stage with him sometimes. You would. Yeah, he invited me on stage with him. And I always say it was exhilarating and exhausting at the same time. And scary because. Yeah. There's no way when, and I only had it a couple times, where um, he would move forward or move backward, and so he would upstage or downstage, and he just knew when in doubt, move about, you know? (laughs) And he would just, he would get that, he just was amazing. He was, he knew every method of, I mean, it's funny to watch Billy Crystal with him on stage. Because Billy would go, of course he's going to kill. Look where he sta- you know, look where he just moved to to do the punch line. <laughs> but he also, it, it's what he did and how he did it. And um, it's just, uh, and you got to, you know, you're that that freaking bird. I, I, Iago, is that how you say it? I, Iago. Iago. So you knew how to say your name. Remember yes. that? Remember those yes. days? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll say, what's your name? You go, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> so, Iago, and were you doing stuff with Robin at the same oh, time in Aladdin? That's, that's the funny thing. I hear stories all the time that say, uh, oh, boy, when Gilbert and Robin would go into the sound booth together, that was crazy. And I never worked once with him during uh, Aladdin. Uh, we were we were recorded separately. And that's the case in most animated things. Once in a while, they put people together. I know in the Toy Story movies, um, um, Tom Hanks and Tim Allen have been in the same room together so they could play off each other. Um, but then Scott Weinger, did you, who is my friend, who was on Full House, who was the voice of Aladdin. Yes. Did you have anything with him in a recording studio or all done separate? I, I remember recording with uh, Jonathan Freeman, who was Jafar. And maybe they had a, a cartoon series for a while, so I may have worked with the other ones. I, I worked with the guy who was the Sultan. I think he was an actor named Douglas Seal, an English actor. Uh, is it because most of the people didn't want to be in the same room with you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was it because of your dry skin balls? <laughs> Do you leave a trail? Is it like eczema? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, if people, if you're looking for me, uh, look down <laughs> on the ground and follow a trail of dry skin. And if you go, hmm. That looks like it came from someone's testicles. <laughs> You'd have to be an expert. Like, that yeah. would be CSI stuff. So, um, in the documentary about you, and you've been a stand-up since you were, what, 18? 15. First um, time I got up on stage, I was 15. I forgot this. And where were you? You know, I should... This should be like an important enough thing that I remember. For a while, I thought it was the bitter end. And then my sister, who came with me to travel from Brooklyn to Manhattan, said it was a different club. So now I don't know. And you, was, it, was it an open mic type night? Yeah, yeah. You write your name down in the book, and then they get you and go, okay, ladies and gentlemen, you I did that at 17. I went on the train from Philadelphia to New York, and I signed up at Catch, and uh, Catch a Rising Star, and I waited 12 hours. I left to go get lunch. I came back. I talked to other people. They were all frustrated and hungry and, you know, hungry for a career and mostly older than me, and a lot of weird stuff was said in that line that was very strange and disconcerting. Did you remember those kind of things? Waiting in line oh, moments? A absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know what gets me is there were so many comics, and some of them real full of themselves. Like, yeah. Uh, like they were already Bob Hope, you know. And um, now I haven't seen them for years. I don't even remember the names of most of them. And right. they were at the clubs back then every night. Every club I went to, I'd see them there. Yeah. And now it's like I said, I don't remember their names. I can't get a clear picture of them in my head. But uh... I've seen a couple. And at the improv, I did it the 12 hour, 14 hour wait. I got there at eight in the morning, signed the sheet. I was still 20th, you know. And the, my first host there was Robert Wall. And Chris Albrecht was the manager at that improv. I'm sure you were there when that was... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he later became my agent and then ran HBO and then ran... Now runs Stars is what I believe is his trajectory. But Maurice LaMarche, remember Maurice? Oh, yes, yes. I think we're going to have him on the podcast. He's actually. very talented. He's a wonderful guy. Um, what's his show? His show is... Uh, is it Pinky and the Brain? Is that the name uh, of it? Yes, and it's funny because for years... 
everyone. Pinky giggles. and the bean. Pinky yeah. and the bean or pinky and the brain? Pinky and the brain. The brain. Pinky okay. And, yeah. Why did I think of a bean? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, because they look like my balls. They, that's what I'm thinking. Two yes, beans yes. are, are your, I don't, I don't want to belabor this, but are they as small <laughs> as, a, as a bean? Yeah, if you want to picture me naked. <laughs> if I go want, in the kitchen if I want, now. it's all I go, do. <laughs> go in the kitchen now. Right. And find two beans. <laughs> and <laughs> put them together with a string of spaghetti in the middle. <laughs> are they like lima beans? Yeah, yes. Pinto? Lima beans Pinto? are too big. A yeah, pinto. Those little red beans. Oh, the red ones. I have them. Yes. <laughs> My oh. wife has all kinds of beans. Is she trying to tell me something? <laughs> Is she trying to sometimes hit? sometimes you were wondering why your wife would be holding two beans <laughs> and, and a piece a of, string sp of spaghetti. spaghetti and going, Oh, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be like you never would go for like a noodle, like a fusilli, <laughs> or if if there's no spaghetti in the house? But spaghetti is good because it's so incredibly thin. Yes, and so so it's so versatile. And it's it, it it's it's cooked already, right? It's al dente, yeah. so it has a flop to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and don't try the butter, uh, the bow tie. Pasta no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Unless you want to dress you, it up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you put it on, and then you can imagine my dick when it goes to a formal event. <laughs> so that's for listeners that have a. a, a a penis that would be the size of two pinto beans yes. and a very limp piece of spaghetti. Yes, actually, angel hair. Oh. Uh, that's the really <laughs> thread. That's very, very thread, thread thick. Yeah, there's no, great. So now you're, no, some listeners need to know this. <laughs> And then if you want to dress it up, you get the bow tie pasta, but yes. just one, just one yeah. piece of bow tie. Well, on, uh, unless you were imitating a girl, and then you'd put it in. <laughs> so it'd be the, the two, spaghetti. The two, <laughs> She'd be the wearing two, a bow. You'd be wearing two bows in your pubic hair because uh, you're dressing up. <laughs> Now, do you think this kind of comedy that we locked in at at about 10? Martha Stewart told me oh, about that. Well, she knows a lot about, a lot about uh, different, size, different ways to make penis-related pasta. I one time called Martha Stewart, and she said, I can't talk now. I've got bow hair. I got bow tie pasta in my pubic hair. I'll have to get back to you. Do you, do you, do you, uh, have you been on her show? No, no. Is it a dream of yours? Uh, yes. So when did you decide that uh, a blue comedy, there are no barriers? Were you telling jokes like that when you were 15? Not yet, but in your no, 20s. The, I, no, met you, I no. met you in your 20s, in your early 20s. Yeah. And uh, the first time, when I started, I was one of those impressionists. That was like, and and so-and-so walks into the room. and There's um, always a destination with what with your humor. Yes. Uh, he, he, was, he was my, my, <laughs> my favorite impressionist uh, put together. He was some really small timer. And his was, the premise was, his car breaks down on the road. And then he'd look up and go, why, it's Humphrey Bogart. Maybe he'll help. <laughs> and that, <laughs> it's, it's Cary Grant. Maybe he'll help. <laughs> 
do you do a Cary Grant impression? I'm uh, not a good one. Well, let me hear what you do, because oh God, let let let's see. Oh, I I have to remember some Cary Grant lines, or uh, no, I'll I'll do it later on. Okay. When I've got oh here oh so I used to do, do impressions. Then I did more and more regular, uh, just stand up. Right. And and for years, when I was doing regular stand up, I worked squeaky clean. You know, it was like I wouldn't say fuck. I'd say you know, uh, have sex with. I did too. I yeah. did too. It was after. Um, it was during my middle twenties where I started to come out of the gate a little more with what I found funny and. I didn't curse for the hell of it. You know, I, I did it because I found it funnier. and I thought it made what I was saying funnier. Yeah, and, and there's something, uh, what I, I think I was worried about in my 20s and why I work clean is sometimes you hear a comedian do a line on TV and the punchline is, I wore a hat. And you go, that's not funny. And then you know when they saw him at the club, he said, I wore a fucking hat. Right. And they right. said, oh, that's good. Just cut out fucking from it. Right. And it was made of shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my bit. Well, you know, <laughs> I, we're in a, uh, the culture we're in, this cancel culture, I've been on the verge of it because they go family guy. You had a bunch of crap happen to you that you're, and you have a heart of gold. You don't have a racist bone in your body. You'll make fun of yourself before anybody else. You'll just do stuff that you find f funny and you don't, and you do what I do, but now we can't do it at all. But years ago, we, we found out we couldn't either, which is when you say stuff, that's how we deal with tragedy, like the worst thing. And that's, kind of the key to you what opens the gate of you is the most catastrophic horrific things on earth is the thing that you have to immediately as a human being of how you work because i've known you forever i kind of function the same way and sometimes i don't say it which is <laughs> i'm lucky <laughs> But That's why you work more than me. No, you, uh, well, nobody. Well, you'll be working once this is over. Uh, once, once we're out by the by the fall, you'll be all over the road getting uh, all your beautiful things from hotels that you put in. Pl Are you going to keep doing that, like in the movie, in your documentary? It shows how you collect all the shampoo bottles. Uh, well, the now they have them on the walls, so yeah, they have the pump shampoo. Oh, so, you don't like so, the pump? Yeah, no, and. But it was funny, getting back to what we were saying about, uh, you know, the sensitive uh, culture now where everyone has to be offended and outraged. No matter what you say, it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't have to be blue. It's just, it's almost anything you say unless it's about yourself. Yeah, I was on Colbert's show and they did a bit about sex in the city where they... Uh, they imposed me in scenes as uh, Kim Cattrall. So I was wearing a blonde wig <laughs> and standing among the other girls. This was just on. Uh, yes. And uh, at least two or three people uh, tweeted me and said they found it extremely offensive and a vicious attack on transgender people. And I go, well, people, guys have been in drag before Shakespeare was born. Yeah. Now it's something to be offended by. Well, times do change through centuries, but it that bit isn't about transgender. It's about Gilbert Gottfried is in replacing Kim Cattrall. That's yes. what that's about. That's all that's about. It, it doesn't matter if it's a man or woman replacing her. It's, uh, or someone, 
that's transgender replacing her. It, it's about what's funny to replace her with. It could have used an aardvark. You know, they yeah. could have done anything. It's just like when you see the Three Stooges in drag. It just, it's just funny. Well, now it is different. It is different. It's some like it hot wouldn't get made. I was, you know, bosom yeah. buddies was kind of taken from that premise of disguising as women. Um, you know, it's a different world, and understandably, I auditioned four times for the T. C. Thomas Howe part in the movie Soul Man. Oh where, my God! And I am lucky I did not get that movie. But his wow. career took off after that, so I guess it was uh, fine. But he, he acted a lot as a, a young person, and it was, you know, the premise was pretty uh, offensive, uh, in retrospect especially. I mean, even when it was offered to me and I went and auditioned, I, had, I was young, I had no movie credit, and I just wanted to be in a movie, and I liked the producer, Steve Tisch, and I, I thought it would be good. And then, but I knew something was wrong. I knew, you know, it was a white guy putting makeup on to fit in and a wig and everything. And I, you know, and we've watched people go through that these past two decades. Um, and it's, it's difficult. Um, I don't think it has the same effect when a, a, a black comedian um, or actor pretends they're a white person. You know, but we, but then Robert Downey Jr. has been questioned for his part in Tropic Thunder, which was unbelievably brilliant what he did. And he, he says, I don't know why I did this, but it was what it was and it, it lives as it lives. So, you know, I don't think that's a direct quote. <laughs> I like to, like to mention people and then make up what they said. It, talk about one of the weirdest ones I've seen. There was a terrible comedy called Old Dracula uh, with David Niven as Dracula. And I forget the actress, actress, comedian, she was black. And, uh, oh, she, oh, uh, he, at first his wife is white, but she bites the, the neck of a black person and then she becomes black. And then at the end, uh, they're walking away and David Niven turns around and David Niven is in blackface. And wow. Yeah, that was like, huh? <laughs> yeah. Now that didn't work then. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just it doesn't See, I'm I know that you're the same as me. Uh in that you really like guys a lot and animals. <laughs> And you like a pony and a, a sheep and a goat. I mean, and, and we like nibbling skin, dry, dry skin, skin off of scratchy, flaky balls. Um, but but you, you know, the things that you've said that you've gotten in trouble for, even in a comedy setting. And what's funny in a stand-up setting is if you offend someone or someone, do, does anybody get offended and yell out, hey, do, have, have they done that before the pandemic when you were touring? Were people doing any of that? Every now and then, you get those audiences that hiss. Those are the worst, the ones that go, Sss. Well, no, no, there's snakes yeah. in the, is that you ever see <laughs> yes. snakes on a plane? This is that. Yes. Yeah, that's when I do... Uh, the New Mexico Comedy Club. <laughs> it's in the desert, and it's it's great because Brian Cranston's in a trailer out back. Um, I got nothing. But what's great is, um, you know, if you get heckled live you, or someone is offended, you can come back with four more versions of the same joke hitting every ethnicity, or or none, or you could just go on set it on attack mode. One one time, I was on stage. I I did a show somewhere, and then I was off stage, and a woman was uh, leading this uh, Asian woman, and the Asian woman was holding one of those like tapping canes that blind people use, and she led her over to me and introduced her. 
And the blind Asian woman said, I'm Japanese and I'm blind. You did jokes about twice. You did jokes about both of those. And, well, let me start all over. She said, I'm Japanese and I'm blind. You did jokes about both of those tonight. And I want to hug you for making me laugh. So she was deaf also? (laughs) (laughs) And, And then she said... But even though I'm 100% deaf, I could still hear the scraping of your dry skin balls. So you scratched your balls on stage? Uh, Yes. Well, that's my showstopper. (laughs) It's also the way you find your way back to the wings after the show's over. And and that's why I have to travel with a giant trunk full of birds <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a magician the great scott do you remember him i'm sure i've seen him yeah and and i was watching him once very fun magic act and i'm i feel bad i'm saying this but one time he pulled out a bird and it was either rubber or i don't think it was i just think it wasn't alive and oh. he pulled it out of his sleeve and we went i don't know if he's he might have to change his name from great <laughs> to medium, okay. Yeah, slightly uh, impressive. <laughs> Humane Society, uh, emergency hotline, Scott. <laughs> um, you're, uh, you and I share a couple things. One, uh, not the ball thing. I'm, I'm very <laughs> I, I can just but recommend- although sometimes we have shared our balls with each other. Well, that's so. in a steam room, and, <laughs> and and we just thought we were sitting just on a towel on the marble, but I didn't know that your your balls were out, and I yeah. accidentally sat on them. And we're not we're not uh, it wasn't sexual. It was just like sitting on your balls. And and by accident. I would scratch your balls and go, I don't feel anything. That was weird. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. that because, and I also remember, I don't scratch that badly. It doesn't feel, <laughs> I can barely feel that. That was if my hand had become so weak and little. It would be that, that My hand feels so small. <laughs> scratching, scratching my balls in the steam room. You don't scratch your balls in the steam room. <laughs> that's that's where the problem with this premise. That's yeah. right. It's right there. That's the only problem with this premise. You don't scratch your balls in the steam room. Uh, was a song by uh, <laughs> Noel Harrison, Rex Harrison's, Rex Harrison's son. son. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you don't scratch your balls. In there the was theme. also B.J. Thomas did an extra song um, not because the famous one he did from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yeah. Kid was Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. It was actually called Gilbert's Dry Ball Skin uh, <laughs> Keeps Falling on My Head. And then, and then there was more to it. I wish he'd stop scratching his balls. And then there was one more line, please send in the birds. So that was that was the original uh, version. This I can't do what you do. You're just uh, okay. Here's what you you've done. We we did the movie The Aristocrats, which a lot of people yes. talk to you about, and will always be memorable. I mean, I I didn't. I recorded it at the Laugh Factory. I'd heard the joke twice. Dom Herrera told it to me in front of the Improv one night. He finished the punchline. I stared at him. I said, "Where's what's the punchline?" And he said, no, that's the point. The point is, because I'm laughing all the way to it, because Dom's good at telling a a joke like that. And it's not a joke. It's how foul can you be? And here's the punchline. We're distinguished. That's the the flip, the aristocratic flip. And I didn't really get that, because I just went, well, it it needs something different, but I can't come up with anything. I don't know how to better it. But you um, did it. And this goes back to my my whole thing, 
when the worst atrocities happen, they always say too soon, too soon, which has become part of our vernacular, of course. But when you do it, it's because, and I don't know how to explain it to people because I try to, do, I do the same thing because it's so painful. You know, uh, I lost my parents. I lost two sisters. Uh, with the exception of one of my sisters, eventually there were jokes with her, but it was so tragic that I couldn't even find the words for that, but because that was a, a immediate one. But I might have had I not loved her so much. So evidently, it comes from not loving people. <laughs> but but you did the nine eleven joke when they had the roast for Hugh Hefner, and that's why the Aristocrats became a film. That's how it happened. I mean, it was taken from that clip of you. Um, so and what what were you going through, and what was your context of it? Yeah, of the joke itself. Of, of, of the actual experience. Of the experience. Well, it was like, you know, a couple of days after September 11th. Just a couple of days? I thought it was a couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't know. I remember it was very soon after. Because I remember, well, this went on for a long time. In New York, there'd be black clouds in the sky. Yeah, I was there three weeks after, and it was it was still going. And um, so a lot of people, a lot of the guests canceled because they just, well, one, they didn't want to do it, and two, they were scared to get on a plane. Why did they do it? Why didn't they postpone it, Gilbert? Yeah, I don't know. It probably would have cost them money postponing it. So Well, they didn't get to air it. Because it was unairable, right? So Jimmy Kimmel hosted it. Hugh Hefner was being roasted. And it was, uh, and and who else was on the roast besides you? Well, uh, Rob Schneider was there. Right. And, um, oh, Jeff Ross. And, I, um, I, oh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Dick Gregory was there. Oh, and, uh, and, oh, iced tea. Uh, but anyway, it was shortly after September 11. And um, it was, there was that feeling in the room. Like, you know, there was that tension. And uh, I wanted to be, uh, like, address the elephant in the room. And also the way, you know, the way uh, we, you know, digest things. It's, uh, it, you know, goes through our heads. And um, so I said, I have to leave early tonight. I couldn't get a direct flight. Uh, we have to make a stop at the Empire State Building. And that was, forget it, boos, hisses. Yeah, it was, it was and quiet, and, and, yes. and the horror. It was the feeling. Yes. And, and, and one guy yelled out too soon, which meant, which I thought meant I didn't take a long enough pause between the setup and the punchline. <laughs> you thought you yeah, thought yeah. he meant your timing was off. Yeah, not I should this have is the most one, two, three, and then, <laughs> and then I I go into the aristocrats because I figured let's go to the bottom level of hell because I, I felt like I was standing there. For 200 years. Did you that, feel at that point, I might as well do the aristocrats because this is probably going to get cut out anyway. Did you uh, have yeah, a feeling I, you were going to be cut out of the show at that yeah, point? Yeah, I, I thought so. And I thought, I, I don't even know if I was thinking that straight. I remember I was looking at this crowd and listening and thinking, like I said, it felt like 200 years I was standing. Yeah, it's hell. Any performer knows... Not, not that they would say what you had said, <laughs> but they know what it's like to have that flop sweat and to go, oh my God, it's terror. It's absolute yeah. terror, right? And uh, so I go into the aristocrats, Joe. Now the audience, an immediate turnaround. They're laughing hysterically. They're howling. They're pounding their hands on the table. And um, I saw one guy scratching his balls in the footage. <laughs> That's not true. It was 
uh, uh, about a hundred guys scratching their balls. <laughs> so get it right. Get your facts straight. I will say that was they were a very flaky audience. Now, why are puns, <laughs> why are puns and, regarded so, so bad? Go ahead, and, continue. And when I was up there, uh, about about two hundred people in the audience <laughs> held up two beans and a string of spaghetti that was luckily <laughs> luckily dinner that night was spaghetti and beans. If I recall, that was the passed around appetizers for Hugh Hefner <laughs> and all the playmates he was surrounded by. <laughs> So that footage in the movie, when you saw it in a theater, The Aristocrats, and I remember my oldest daughter, Aubrey, who you met, you know, all my kids, um, and I want you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> she she called me. I was in New York, and she said, Dad, I'm, I'm going in to see The Aristocrats. I'm so excited. The theater in Westwood is sold out. I can't wait. I went, honey, please don't go, don't go in there. Don't go in there. Please don't. <laughs> Don't, you don't know what I say in it. I love you, Dad. Bye. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. This is going to be... How do I undo this? Because she was actually part of the original way my humor put me in the movie because I was known as a guy who would say the worst thing. And I didn't do it for any other reason except that's what my dad did under duress because he wore a duress. And... <laughs> And he had very flaky. When you wear a kilt, that's yeah. why Scotsmen do it because they can scratch their bag pipes. They could get, and they could get, you know, the moist Scotland air. Oh my on their God! Balls. With the ravens coming in, um, so that became a classic piece of footage. And the way it was shot, it felt like I was watching, you know. Network. I felt like I was watching, you know, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Get out of your seats. Everyone stand up. But you're saying, and you know, how the family's having sex with each other, which is horrific, as we know. It's not something you condone by telling the joke, correct? Well, just because you don't enjoy it doesn't <laughs> mean other people can't. Well, I will say that I was in the room with my mother during hospice, and there was <laughs> one moment where she wasn't looking. That I thought, you know, <laughs> I mean, she was glowing. Um, <laughs> my mom, when she was in hospice, uh, John Stamos and Dave Collier came to visit her, and she put on makeup as as John was coming in the room. I said, "Mom, you you're not going to have sex with him. You're you're just <laughs> just coming. I want to look nice for John." <laughs> So please continue. So you do this thing, and how did it end? Was that your closing when you told the aristocrats? Yeah, that was the closing. And uh, one one uh, writer, and uh, he did a review of the roast, and he said it was like I performed a mass tracheotomy on the crowd. <laughs> and I always thought that was, yeah, it allowed them to breathe. <laughs> yeah. He didn't mean it that way, though, correct? Yes, no, he meant I was screwed. You were, you. <laughs> what did he mean? He meant I opened the can of beans. <laughs> Pint, pinto. Two, two of the pinto. Two, and I picked out two of the smallest ones. <laughs> <laughs> and a string of spaghetti. <laughs> a tiny little string, right? Angel, tiny, angel hair. Tiny little string <laughs> of spaghetti. Cooked a little bit, just so it's floppy. <laughs> with angel hair also on with, the side. With with tomato sauce stripping from it. <laughs> oh. So you'd go, oh, he has a venereal disease and his stink is bleeding. Now, does, does that happen when you get when, venereal when disease? Does when you, I do you call, bleed? One, do you time bleed? I, one time I called Martha Stewart, <laughs> and she said, I can't talk now. I've got tomato sauce dripping out of my cunt. No. No. Gilbert, 
Why Which is it I always? Think, I what? think Olivia Newton John made that into an album. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> was that on the Have You Ever Been Mellow? Uh, yeah. Um, hey, Olivia Newton John's a Jew. You, could you believe that one? No, that's amazing. Yeah. Yes, her her father, I think, was a Jew, and and well, I. It's and on I the heard, it's on the mother's side, I think, in the Jewish faith, isn't it? Well, I take it wherever, uh, and <laughs> may, so maybe. But anyway, she's part Jewish, and um, uh, her her father, I think, her father and <laughs> uncle, or her father and grandfather, are like incredible geniuses, like they're like you know crazy level. Uh, intelligent. I I just read that somewhere, because when she were I went to see her in concert. And what did she sing? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, she closed the show. <laughs> see first first she sang. <laughs> what did she open with? Yeah, first she closed with, I want to get, let's get physical. And the audience is cheering, and she walks off, then she comes back and does something from Greece. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I got chills, that's multiplying, whatever. And the audience is cheering, and then you think she's off for good, and she came back, Olivia Newton-John, and sang, I've got tomato sauce <laughs> dripping from my cup. She didn't say because she has venereal disease? <laughs> well, that was in that was in the playbill. <laughs> <laughs> they explain it. <laughs> I think it's just amazing that they would notate an encore of an encore in the playbill. <laughs> I don't say that word that often. Um, I'm only I only say it in, in you know when I'm yelling at someone, and I often call a guy that. And in England, uh, that word "cunt" is is used in it in a way that's uh, not as offensive. Or in Australia, whereas yeah. in North America, it is what it is, which is probably the worst word that you can say according to the uh, the Gospel of George Carlin. And um. Also, uh, wait, uh, let's see. I, I, you know, Boris Karloff's <laughs> real name was William Henry Pratt. And I, I, I think in England, calling someone a Pratt is like calling them a cunt. Because Pratt, I heard, was a dirty word in England. I didn't know that. I was in yeah. Australia, and I mentioned fanny pack, and because it was like, oh, I need a fanny pack to keep all my stuff in, and the audience was aghast because that is like, that that's your front fanny. It, it's not your back fanny. It's like saying cunt. Yeah. Saying fanny, and um, I tried to say it, but I didn't really get pleasure in it. <laughs> What what was the just to finish the aristocrats thing? What was your um, when that came out? What happened in to you? Did do you suddenly get calls for more gigs and they wanted you to be dirtier? And did everybody want you to tell the joke? Because I've been asked to tell the joke and I don't. I did it like once or twice because I can't summon that. It does. It feels like George Carlin said, "Just do it behind the alley," and it lived in that documentary. Yeah, it's like with me, I'll do dirty jokes. Uh, I'll do a lot of dirty jokes, but the aristocrats, uh, yeah, I feel like, uh, I I don't know. I'll do an equally dirty joke, but not the aristocrats. Right. I do the same thing. I'll try to please them. It's usually, I mean, I'll tell jokes my dad would tell, or it always does start with a man. Oh, there was one time. I forget what city I was in. I think it was. I think it was Dry Bulls, Indiana. <laughs> uh, but they had, uh, by law, they had to have someone uh, for the deaf, 
uh, doing sign language. Yes. And uh, so there was this woman doing sign language through my whole life. And then I did the aristocrats because I wanted to see all the movement she was doing. So then I was, I was gladly, yeah. and I did like an extra long version right. of the aristocrat just to watch this woman try to come up with like different hand movements. It's so wonderful to do that. And I've had my shows signed before. I've done a play where I've, I've had it signed by someone robin was of course amazing and it's on that exists on tape where he would have a person doing sign language while he was and he would we'd all go to extremes one of my favorite shows was that what i told the aristocrats at was at university of central florida and anthony jesselnik was had been doing it probably for i don't know probably a long time but it's i he wasn't that, that as well known and wonderful as he is now, but he was wonderful. He he, he crushed, uh, as they say, <laughs> and uh, it was like eleven thousand people, like three thousand, four thousand got turned away because it was icy snow, and I was so honored because college kids aren't always the best audiences, and sometimes they were for me for some reason for a good fifteen years. I loved it. Um, Twenty years, I don't know. And it wasn't as much, we'll cancel you or, oh, you know, yelling weird stuff or being negative or sarcastic, you know, just, I don't know, cynical. And they were wonderful and they were quiet. You couldn't hear anything. And it was so dark in there. Just the stage was lit. I almost fell off the stage and I landed one foot in front of a guy with my crotch at his face. So I had a couple of minutes from that, you know, just, you know, pretending that he was uh, doing stuff to me. But I told the aristocrats because they were such a good audience and they screamed for it. And I, I did like an hour and a half and Anthony did like a half hour. They were so great. And it was just, I did it. Be, I, they, I just felt like they deserved it at the time. That's what they wanted. Okay. You know, it was just like you were having so much fun with your signing person doing it. So that, that's what I felt. Oh, and I did it once at the uh, the Juggalos. What's that? That's that's that. It's uh, I always describe it as uh, Woodstock if Woodstock took place in hell. <laughs> uh, yeah, these these people like they dress up in clown uh, faces and stuff. It's a very weird event. The ju- I've done it a few times. Where does it take place? Well, it's it's outside, and it's like I remember they. What picked city? Me up what from, city? I, I think I think it moves around, and they pick <laughs> me up, and they're driving, and then they're driving on like dirt roads, and then places where it doesn't even seem like that it's a road anymore, and and it's it's a very peculiar. But I did do the aristocrats there. Now, what I remember is when the movie came out uh, and people would say to me, uh, oh, Bob Saget was dirty. And I said, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was like... It, it was so known. It yeah, was, yes. It was like... It, it's like nobody who <laughs> knew you were going, oh, my God. Yeah, they're right. They only thought that, that I can be a character on a TV show. May I have that? Yes, you yeah, I'll just wipe sign this it nose. For you. I just want you to know with a tissue, with a Kleenex. Oh, I on a documentary. I um, uh, they. Said, <laughs> <laughs> this is true. They said <laughs> Hitler. See, I oh, you always have to get back to Hitler. Yeah, because who's funnier? Yeah, Hitler liked jokes. But he didn't like dirty jokes. I, I, that was an interesting thing. So I guess there was some, there was some morals <laughs> to the guy. So he had ethics. Yes. <laughs> We've gone through See, that. I, I the- knew, I knew there was a reason I didn't like Hitler. <laughs> and <that's it. laughs> you couldn't think of a reason to not like Hitler till till this moment. That he didn't like dirty jokes. I think Doris Day sang, 
I can't think of a reason not to like it. <laughs> I don't think she did that. I don't think she was a sympathizer. <laughs> and she, one of her movies had that title. <laughs> and, and it had Rock Hudson, uh, <laughs> Paul Lynn. Um, Alice Ghostly and Paul Lynn. You never, never saw them in the same room. That was weird. They were that borrowing was, a, an attitude. Yeah, that was like, uh, who came up with that first? I would think Paul for some reason. Yeah. Or I don't know, maybe Alice. Paul Lynn hated the Jews. I don't think so. Yes, yes, he did. Uh, but but uh, I don't understand that, because anybody that gets profiled for who they are, you would think would not hate other people for but that. What am I talking about? This is 2020 and 2021, so... Yeah, we're in a time where people hate people more for what that they're not their group. Yeah, see, I had heard it before, and then I was talking to one of the producers on uh, when I was doing uh, Hollywood Squares, and he he was he was also a producer on the original Hollywood Squares, and he said that during lunch, all of the Guests would be like having lunch and laughing and telling stories. And Paul Lynn would be drunk out of his mind. And he'd, he'd immediately go, oh, those fucking Jews. They're <laughs> the reason I don't have a career. Well, maybe he was joking. Maybe he was... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was just having fun at their expense because he had a couple drinks. No, his his people I heard hated the Jews, <laughs> which is going to be in my this new book. Here's call, people hate the Jews. Um, this is going to uh, be in the synopsis of this podcast. Yeah. And Gilbert talks about famous people who hated Jews. Paul Lynn. Um, oh, I heard recently Wilfred Brimley. I heard that also, that he used to like them in his oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Oatmeal's very flaky before you add the water. Sometimes. <laughs> Wilfred Brimley, <laughs> and he had to do it with tweezers, pick out two little <laughs> grains of oatmeal. And what would he do and, with those? And he'd pluck out a hair. In his head. And he go, this is Gilbert cock and balls. Because <laughs> he hated it's, you and your faith. And he said, well, let me goes, let me ask you a question. Are you? No, he, Wilfred Brimley used to say, <laughs> Gilbert's cock and balls. It's the right thing to do and the right way to do. That's, that's what he said about you. Uh, are, 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 you're, you're not a religious person, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. so well, what do you, but do you, you have faith, right? Uh, I, you believe no. in it. You believe in anything? Do you believe in stuff? Do you believe no, in... I, uh, you got kids, so that gives you... And you have beautiful kids, so does that give you some kind of belief in something? <laughs> Not really, no. But what I realize in having kids, it's not until you have kids that you realize what your parents were. Right. Like when you're growing up, you have no idea. What are they saying this and that? And why are they getting in my way? And they're so out of it and all this stuff. And then when you have a kid, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Because you love them. And, you, and I know you fight loving them. They're very cute. Your kids are really cute. Oh, thank you. No, I mean, I've been watching them. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, your wife put a, a baby camera in their room. <laughs> My kids told me <laughs> that guy from Full House, he rode past our school in a van. And, and he said, I'm looking for my puppy. Could you come into the van? I've got plenty of candy here if you get hungry. 
So the guy from Full House basically said <laughs> stuff from the 50s. From when people would have like red alerts of, of horrible people. Now, Gilbert, you got me in trouble um, on the roast that you did f uh, yeah. for me. But we'll talk about it after uh, this break. Hey, everybody. I want you to understand that this is a paid sponsorship and it's brought to you by BetterHelp. Does something interfere with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? I think all of us have gone through that. We've figured out ways to improve ourselves. We try to read self-help books. We go to people. We listen to people that we think can help us. But sometimes we actually need a professional and someone that can help us individually. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Connect in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. Send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional online counseling and financial aid is available. The service is available for clients worldwide. Find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to the counselors located near you. Licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, anything that you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, affordable, and you can check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. It's not a crisis line. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. We want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our BetterHelp sponsor at betterhelp.com slash bob. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bob. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bob. Thank you. Okay, so... Hi, we're back. We're back. Uh, somebody named something that, I think. One of the podcasts is called We're Back. I can't remember. But, Gilbert, at the roast, at the my roast... Um, which was a really fun one because I had friends on it. Stamos hosted it, and Jeff Ross, Jeff Garland, Norm MacDonald, uh, Lovitz, uh, you know, a lot of people that we like. Jim Norton, Greg Giraldo, who I became friends with afterward because he ripped me apart so badly. And I thought that was going to be the end of it, that nobody will hit me that hard until you got up. And Gilbert, you said something to me on the roast that's still on Twitter. People comment to me. <laughs> That has been spun to some young people that it's actually fact because we're in the <laughs> dumbest fucking culture we've ever been in. And if someone says something is a joke and 15 years or 20 years or more has passed, it becomes, I read that, it's true. And yes, you, yes. you said something about me and you said it probably 20 times during... <laughs> Maybe 10, but that's enough. And could you just state it as the disclaimer that it is? To let people know that this did not happen. And you said this as a joke that people took seriously that has really followed me around in an upsetting way. Because it's the opposite of who I am. Well, now you're, now you're trying to back out of something. You're feeling guilty. After all these years, and you, look, look, like a lot of serial killers. <laughs> don't have podcasts. They don't have podcasts. <laughs> right. A, a lot of serial killers, they, they've they killed and, uh, and tortured so many people, but they can't deal with it. <laughs> and so they pretend it didn't happen. Right. So, so you, Mr. Sackett. <laughs> God. You're, why are you making this worse? Just say what you said. Just say it with, instead of an accusation. 
if you could just <laughs> phrase <laughs> phrase what you said about me. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm torturing my own life. I say the actual line. I guess. I guess. I mean, people yeah. want to know, and uh, and okay. okay. Uh, what I said was, why are we honoring Bob Saget? Why should we honor a man who raped and killed a girl in 1990? <laughs> and then I went on and on going, well, it's not true. It's not true that Bob Saget raped and killed a girl in 1990. And you so, kept oh, saying, yeah, it's, not, yeah, yeah. it's not true yeah. again, but you, you kept saying it. Yeah. And that is uh, actually a brilliant roasting joke. It, it is, it's brilliant. It's like saying the worst thing you can about someone. And then you're, um, I don't know why I'm dissecting it. I'm just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, it's, it's it, but that's people, what's... people say that I did that, um, which is quite uh, disconcerting. When you read it, because Twitter has, as you know, such a more horrific, you don't understand the context of anything when it's, a, when it's not on, even if it's on video. If, if they watch you doing that line for six, seven minutes <laughs> over and over again, <laughs> they get, I think most people would understand. That yes, yes. I, I am, uh, as, I you do that about someone who's uh, basically a good person is what you do that about. A good person or you. <laughs> one of the, one time when I spoke to you, we were at a restaurant. Yeah. And you might want to clip this from the show. I don't know. Uh, you, we were in a restaurant. And it already is this sounds- when you got the jacket from the hotel because you didn't have the right jacket, so they lent you a jacket, a sports coat? Maybe I don't know. I think so. I think oh. your your lovely wife brought um, a, a sport coat that didn't fit you. It was big for you. And I remember. Okay, this is already going to sound like the punchline. Uh, you uh, took me into the men's room, uh, but <laughs> actually, <laughs> and actually, that's not where it's not headed where uh, you think it is. <laughs> oh, but that happened afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, the audience now is saying, oh, and then we fucked each other in the ass, <laughs> which we did. But that's not the point of the story. Honestly, with the height difference, I don't know how it would have happened. I don't know how either of us could have made that work. I, I stood on one of those plastic milk cartons. Yeah, they were in the back there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You would need two of them. <laughs> and I'd need a half apple. And then they, they brought in a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and you, you, oh, you pointed to some <laughs> uh, girl on, in a picture on the wall, and you said, this is the most horrible human being uh, on the planet. I did? Yes. Oh, it must have been someone that I, I heard or or I had a bad experience with. Yes. Oh, well, let's not say who that is because I don't well, remember I, any I don't of that. know who it is. Oh, good, good. Well, well let's you just were, say... You it, do, I you remember do remem- they had a picture of Ava Braun. <laughs> <laughs> and you looked at it and thought, gee, I knew there was a reason I didn't like Ava Braun. <laughs> But the fucking each other in the ass part <laughs> is true. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've never even seen you uh, without clothes on, which was so painful to penetrate you because I had to, <laughs> you don't know what I had to do. I had a, a piece of wood, like a dowel, and I duct taped around my penis <laughs> in order to break through your pants and you were wearing trousers proper trousers because you don't wear jeans i've never seen you in jeans do you wear jeans? i wear jeans all the time well you didn't that night yeah <laughs> now we 
I sat at dinner. I did your podcast, the, the colossal uh, Gilbert. Gil, Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. And it's amazing. And I've been on it twice. I've been honored to be on it. I think even a third appearance in some way or something. I don't remember. But um, I asked you a question, and I asked you that night at dinner. That's where it came from. Because I wanted to know where does this comedy come from? And I asked you honestly, were you ever abused as a kid? And you, you shook your head no. And then I said, well, did you, were your parents or grandparents in, in a concentration camp? And you shook your head no. And then I said, so not, did anything horrific happen to you as a child? And you shook your head no. And my, my retort then was, so why? <laughs> so what you, drove you to have comedy where you have to include Martha Stewart and anal sex in the same paragraph? What what <laughs> is the is it just that's what made you were you told not to laugh at stuff like that as a kid cuz I was by my mom uh, well, the reason I do jokes about Martha Stewart getting fucked in the ass is because growing up, <laughs> I would watch Red Skelton. <laughs> and <laughs> he'd close every show with that line. He'd go, Martha Stewart getting fucked in the head. <laughs> That's not God, what he and, would say. And, he would and say, "And God bless." <laughs> and good night. Yes. It, yeah, but I don't think he mentioned Martha, who wasn't even. She was not born, I don't think, or or she was, but she was a kid watching the Red Skelton show. That's why Red Skelton was ahead of his time. <laughs> Did you watch the Red Skelton show? I, I would watch it in that way that you watch. There was those shows that you used to watch because you had like, you know, three channels. And so you were like, ah, I guess I'll watch this. But I was never a big fan of Red Skelton's show. I, I became more of a fan when Johnny Carson would always love him so much. And I looked up to Johnny Carson's comedy senses so much, even as a kid. Then I would go back. But I did watch Red Skelton show. I watched Danny Kay show. And I'm sure that brings things to mind when I mentioned Danny Kay to you. <laughs> well, Danny Kay hated the Jews. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I don't okay. think that. Here's a story I heard. <laughs> you're you you're pre TMZ. That's what you are. You know, because that's our references now. <laughs> you know, all the trash that everyone has on everybody is all like, you know, I heard, and that's it. That's, <laughs> yes, yes. A source that, told us. A source. Could, yeah. Well, I I I think what uh, like a lot of gossip things do. The uh, websites, TV shows, newspapers, is they'll give the story to another uh, newspaper, right? And they'll print it, and they so they could say, well, according to, and they uh, say the name of that paper, so they can't get in trouble. I I wrote a joke like that. I I said the joke was men can breastfeed. I I read that. And then I said, okay, I wrote it down, and then I read it. <laughs> and, and so that's basically where we're at. Somebody can write something down. Someone can even just, everybody's making shit up. It's just ridiculous. Whereas your, your stuff about your ball skin and Martha Stewart, that's all fact to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, this is actual fact. Uh, I, and I, I, I've said, I've, I've told this story on my podcast, Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast, about 500 times. One time I was doing a guest spot or movie on some movie lot, and word got around the movie lot that Mr. Belvedere 
was being rushed to the hospital because <laughs> he he sat on his own balls. <laughs> That was actually um, not him. It was Mr. Balvedere. <laughs> <laughs> That's my gift. So is that is that true that you'd heard that? Yes. Or you just made it up? Uh, that, no, that's absolutely true. That he sat on his own ball. At work? <laughs> Did he do it at work? Yes. Why would he be on a movie lot if not at work? He was there, well, sat well, down. Well, we don't, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's some guys that hang out. And sit on their balls while people are doing films. In fact, Pat Boone <laughs> had a big hit. Or it could have been Debbie Boone. Who uh, had a big hit with Mr. Belvedere sat on his balls. <laughs> was it a Christmas song? Uh, yes. Yeah. It, it was a thinly veiled uh, a song about Jesus. <laughs> Much like you light up my life. <laughs> In fact, you light up my life. The music, do you light up my life? Used to be. And Mr. Belvedere sat on his balls. Oh, how it hurt. <laughs> and then it would be, he brings me hope. <laughs> To carry on. So, Gilbert, um, yes. of all the things you've done, and you did a thing in my movie, Farce of the Penguins, which yes. was just stock footage of penguins. The mouths didn't move. It was just <laughs> stock footage. It was, you know, I loved What's Up, Tiger Lily, which had a lot more technology to it when Woody made that. And I, Samuel L. Jackson, who we both love, narrated it and you were a penguin who said i'm freezing my balls off of course i wrote it for you and, yeah, sure. and, and he said well technically you're a penguin you don't have balls and do you remember your response to him when he corrected you oh no what was i, I believe it was fuck you <laughs> I'm freezing my balls off. Or, I, or, I'm known for my witty comebacks. Yes, and then there was a sound of them falling off, of your balls falling off, and then you were screaming and walking away over what had happened to your nuts, your balls. And, I can't remember. And also, also on the podcast, I had John Sebastian, and I know the words to the entire song of What's Up, Tiger Lily. Really? Yeah. I've always been the guy with the finger in his nose when the passport picture gets taken. When the big guy tastes out for seal and chickens on the one caught holding the bacon. When they drop a piano from the 42nd floor, I'm always underneath looking up. When the tidal wave strikes 100 miles at sea, I'm out on the rail throwing up. And din, din. We kapow! Somehow I would have met you anyhow. We fixed it up, and a holy cow, if my friends could see me now. So I got to sing that with John Sebastian. Now, because I knew them. Did he write that song for the movie? Yeah. So Woody did not write those lyrics? No, that was uh, John Sebastian. Who also, for the kids listening, that are the parents of the kids listening, he wrote Welcome Back from Welcome Back, Cotter. Yes. But he also wrote, you know, what a day for a daydream. I mean, he wrote, he was the Turtles. He was quite brilliant. Yeah. In the and, summertime. Oh, not the, not Mungo Jerry, but the. <laughs> oh, yes. So. Oh, and Summer in the City. Yeah. 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 That, hot that, time, Summer in the City. Take out my bra and get some titty. <laughs> yes. um, um, I don't know if I play along with you, I'll just get sued. But you don't get sued. Do you get sued? Has Martha Stewart ever written you a, a, a direct message? Please a stop. A cease and desist offer. <laughs> has, anybody, Order. has anybody said, please stop it? Uh, no, no. They say, uh, in fact... <laughs> Martha Stewart 
<laughs> said, can you please say it more often? <laughs> Did she say it to you while you were in the act? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert, what was it that... Did you have, uh, I, I forget this, brothers, sisters? You have a sister. Uh, yeah, I had two older sisters. Are they around? Uh, one of them, yeah. Why did you kill the other one? <laughs> <laughs> did the one that you like, is, is she still alive? <laughs> I think life is so hard that that's what makes a comedian want to do it even more. And if we're having difficult moments, even while we're performing, it makes us want to do it even more. Yes. Whether, you know, some people like Jerry or crafts people and they just want it to be smartly and in a very good way methodical way want to do just great work and write the best joke possible i think you and i share that we're that 10 year old kid that is told this isn't funny please stop it and you just triple down on it and and yeah. get more hyper when someone tells me don't do it then i get an incredible urge to do it it's really funny uh, I, the sclerodermer research foundation benefit that we do robin as i said did it so many times and he had a, a bit, Robin, uh, where he would be have his elbow and he'd be eating out of the inside of his arm and be performing cunnilingus for like six minutes and um, or however long it needed to go for that audience yes. uh, and how difficult it was and how, you know, and everyone has tackled this subject before. But, you know, with Robin doing it, it was... And people don't think of Robin as a dirty comedian. It's it's absurd because you would watch it at live especially and it would be filtered with some poignant comments and then off the wall amazing references all thrown together in an improv mishmash and then some bits that if you did them, they would go, oh my God, it's so dirty, you know, but... Robin had this uh, that gift that you know and and um, so the woman who founded the organization Sharon Monsky who uh, passed away years ago was a dear friend of mine and she had scleroderma pretty bad and she eventually uh, lost her life to it and she said Bob would you please tell Robin not to do that kind of lingus material please where he, he puts his mouth in the middle of his arm and and pretends he's doing that, please ask him not to do that. And I went up to him and I said, Robin, I have a request from Sharon. And he loved Sharon. There was no way you would have loved Sharon because she founded the organization and she was just a fiery, strong person, one of the sweetest people. And he would never want to hurt her. He would do anything she asked. He would come to the benefit. What do you need, chief? You know, what does Sharon yeah. want? What do you want? I said, she doesn't. Could you not do that kind of lingus bit and not eat out your <laughs> inside of your arm? And he said, okay, okay. Um, and he's about to go on, and his mind's got fireworks going off. You know what he was like. Yeah. He gets on stage and does a couple of minutes, and then it's, about seven minutes of kind of ling of eating out is uh, yes. <laughs> how hard it is. You can't understand. No, no one can hear you while you're eating out someone. And and Sharon looked at me in the, in the audience. And I just went, what, "What do you want me to do?" You, I, mean, I shouldn't. Have, I shouldn't have said anything. I you know you you can't tell the the kid that wants to just. That brings us joy in a weird way. And I've, I've done it with audiences where the, they'll, someone will say, that offended me. And then I'll just, uh, I don't do it as much now. Well, I don't do nothing now till we're able to perform again. But if someone says that's a horrible thing you said, I, I'll do three things like that to make it worse. Like, yes, yes. So when I did your podcast the last time, uh, the last 15 minutes, uh, there were things we said that are foreboding and people are saying that was the funniest. Oh my God. The yes. last 15 minutes. What was it that we were off on 
Was it the thing about... Um, it Santa Claus was in it. What, it wasn't that song, Today I Saw the uh, yeah. Dummy. Uh, do we even want to go there? Uh, yeah, I remember the last 15 minutes. We both totally lost it and were as obscene. And That's what it was. As possible. And there's a time and a place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still haven't found the time of the place. No, that's what I'm saying. It's any... <laughs> People say there's a time and a place, and there just isn't. <laughs> there isn't. There is. Yes, people have paid money to see you uh, in a show, and you, you come out on stage, and in your mind, this still isn't the time and the place. <laughs> <laughs> but making people laugh, that's still... Does, aren't you looking forward to going out and doing that again now? It's, you know what's so strange? Sometimes I'll think of a line in my act and I go, what line led into that? What yeah. Is, yeah. Are it's, you writing down new things? Are you thinking of things? No, I'm still going, hey, uh, how many of you watch Gunsmoke? <laughs> <laughs> you might have a whole bit about... Um, uh, laying on your back with your pants down <laughs> <laughs> and birds that all started simply because I heard a scratching sound and you explained what it was but it, uh, but then bird watchers started complaining they are very offensive. upset yeah. yes um, Jane Drysdale from the Beverly Hillbillies she yeah. was she was a, a bird watcher so she would have loved. She would have loved this segment. Who was the actress that played her? Oh, I should know this. It's not Nancy Culp, is it? I Nancy Culp was, and was she the one with the long face? Like I, I, I think it might be. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah, it's Nancy Culp. Yeah. She, she was on the Beverly Hillbillies, and she was a bird watcher. So she. If she lived across the street from your building, yes. would see you Which laying on did. your. She, oh, she did. <laughs> and she she had a pair of binoculars <laughs> that she got from the government from NASA. <laughs> <laughs> One of those telescopes that they see the surface of Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be an incredibly, <laughs> incredibly. <laughs> telescopic lens to be yes. able to see minute, minute things. Yes. Be able to see a pair of tweezers, for example. <laughs> so she would watch every morning. <laughs> what was happening? What was she looking at? Funny you should ask. <laughs> Uh, she was watching birds <laughs> nipping. <laughs> well, it was just like this song. <laughs> which which song was that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one that Sandler and Young <laughs> sang it, and one of them would sing it in English and the other in French. <laughs> Right, right. And it was about birds that were pecking at your uh, dry ball skin, correct? And that's, that was a popular Christmas song. <laughs> and, and birds all nipping at your balls. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, it ended with Merry Christmas. <laughs> And then at the very end, you'd hear. Arr, arr, arr. <laughs> now, Iago, do people ask you to do that voice? Uh, yeah, it's like it, like it's so different. Right, it, it's just you, right? Yeah. Is there any adjustment? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I, I. <laughs> you know what I want to ask you, Gilbert? Yeah, I want to yeah. ask you, what's your favorite thing is there something that stands out as oh my god i can't believe i was part of that 
that was such a great thing? Is there a movie? Is there a TV show? Is there a particular appearance? Is, does anything stand out? That Oh, that I was involved in? Yes. No, no. Other things you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite movie that you're not in? <laughs> well, my favorite dessert is lemon meringue pie. That's a good, that's, that, that's an answer. Is that yeah. really your favorite dessert? No. What's your real favorite dessert? Oh, anything with chocolate and peanut butter together. Yeah. Oh. So you like Reese's peanut butter cups? Well, what I like is getting a scoop of chocolate ice cream. And, and if they've got peanut butter sauce. Not everybody does. Yeah. Do you have difficulty with that? That not everyone does? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah I've gotten into arguments. <laughs> have you seen a therapist ever? Uh, no, no. Do I look like someone who's seen a therapist? No, I mean, have you ever seen one? I mean, just uh, look yeah. at look I at... saw one leaving his office. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> okay, and in, in answer to your other question, I... Well, I would, I'm happy to be a part of Aladdin because that was, you know, a top-notch quality production. Right. Which I'm not known for, usually. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm very happy about my, my one scene in Beverly Hills Cop 2 because that we just improvised and had a lot of fun with. Was that just Eddie saying, I want Gilbert here? Uh, no, the funny thing is, that's what everyone was saying. And uh, and Eddie told me he didn't even know I was in the picture till he looked at the call sheet. I'm really happy he's coming back and doing more stuff. And uh, I hear he's going to do stand-up, which would be fantastic. You, you want to name, let's name the worst Eddie Murphy films. <laughs> That's such a positive premise. I guess it was, uh, I mean, I, his worst film is a lot of people's best film. Yeah. Seriously, oh, seriously. There's a lot of people that do comedies, and he's just, I, I don't know. I just think he's another level of everything. Oh, he is. I also think that you are um, one of the funniest people on, on earth. I, and one of the sweetest. You're literally one of the sweetest people that I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, see, now I don't know how to respond. I know. See, the other day I was talking to you on the phone, and I, I, I threw you off, and I said, I love you. And I don't know, it's the quarantine, it's the thinking about people I care about in my life, people I've known forever, and um, I just had an emotional thing. I've been that way lately. I don't know, have you been that way a little bit more because of this I, time? I think so, yeah. And I said, I love you, and you, I, knew, I, I said, you don't have to say anything, and you said faintly, I love you too. Uh, and then I felt so bad that, I, I didn't mean to force you into saying it, but it meant so much to me that you said, you said it. I, I was hoping you were going to answer with, I, I, I love fucking you in the ass. That's what I thought. <laughs> that, that to me would have been a pure, well, that, that's that how you show been, love. That would have been more sincere. Right. <laughs> I love fucking you in the ass. So when you tell someone you love them, that's how you tell them? <laughs> I mean, you don't say that to your family, do you? <laughs> I I think the uh, a slogan for that commercial was "Nothing says I love you <laughs> like fucking Bob Saget in the ass," which <laughs> and you weren't even known at the time. So no, that well, that's it. why I was able to put up with it. You know, you do a lot of things before you get known. Before you do a family show, you, you take a lot of hits. 
Well, Gilbert, I, I yes. can't wait till I uh, get to see you in person. Uh, yeah, I want to see you in person, too. So we can... <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> so, so we can vote. <laughs> well, you fill in the blank. Well, it'll be in the steam room. <laughs> <laughs> And there's going to be balls involved. It'll be at the bird sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you luck with the pasta that your wife is cooking right now. Oh, oh, let me let me say I'm also on Cameo. Oh, yes. So if people want Gilbert to deliver them a message, you go to uh, Cameo.com slash Gilbert Gottfried. That's right. Cameo.com slash Gilbert Gottfried. And Gottfried is G-O-T-T-F-R-I-E-D. Thank you. I used to think it was Gottfried, and people used to say my name wrong. And, and God, Arthur Godfrey, that which I've been called a couple of times by people, how, how anyone remembers him, but they go, oh, yeah, you're, you're uh, Arthur Godfrey. I've been called Pat Sajak. I would be like, wow, thanks. Just spin oh. the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, um, uh, Arthur Godfrey hated the Jews. <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. Oh, it is. This is legend. So he would have his amateur hour, right? So yes. he would go, and this next act is Esther Cohen, but don't like her. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how she does with her talent competition. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sending you all my best, and I can't wait to see you, and I'm glad we didn't uh, say anything that, uh, that... Even vaguely offensive. Nothing was offensive, and we cut out as much as we could. <laughs> 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 and I'm sending all my love to you and your family. You have the most beautiful wife and kids, and they're the same person, which is so great. <laughs> People say, how's your wife and kids? I go, she's great. <laughs> See, it's one person. See, I'm expounding on something that didn't work the first time. <laughs> what are you going to do now? Uh, go out on the balcony. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to lay on your back on the balcony? First, I'll look up to heaven, and I'll scream. What? This is for you, Nancy Culp. <laughs> and hopefully she's in heaven with binoculars <laughs> yes. as, as the birds come and create the flakes that started the podcast. Well, see, in heaven, she won't need binoculars anymore. Oh. One of the things... That you're blessed with in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Is to be able to look down on the earth and watch birds. I, in, if you listen, go up to any priest or nun and say, What's, why do people want to go to heaven? And they will tell you, well, it's because in heaven you could get a clear view of birds picking at Gilbert's. Bald skin. <laughs> well, I think that's a good thing to leave everybody with. <laughs> <laughs> I can't thank you enough for being here, and I can't wait to see you. So uh, I'll, I'll see you this year. I'll, I'll be in New York. So uh, by the end of the year, we'll all have a good laugh in a restaurant. Oh, okay. I mean you'll, it. And you'll yeah, you'll yes. bring a little I might wherever we go, I might bring a little doily to put wherever you sit. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I know there's gonna be I, I remnants. remember we we once had dinner. It was you, me, Jeffrey Ross. And Norm. And Norm McDonald. And it was really funny because you and I had dinner the night before as well. And we continued to talk about 
uh, this song that we were singing that Larry Ragland, a yeah. uh, funny, yes. funny, nice man, used to sing. And then Norm, Norm said, ah, oh, it's great to get together and hear you guys do an inside joke. Thanks. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But you couldn't stop laughing, and it made me so happy to watch you cry. You're... Yeah, we're like little kids when we get together. I'm trying to be the older brother now and then. But... <laughs> well, stay safe and well, Gilbert. And oh, ha- you too. Thanks, and have a good night. Good night. Okay, love you. I never said that. And all right, love you. Ah. Ah. That's my friend Gilbert, my friend since I'm in my early 20s. Gilbert Gottfried, a unique person who can't be stopped uh, with his comedy. He's just such uh, and I, I got to tell you, he's the sweetest guy and um, always has been such a, and very quiet a lot of times, unless he's come out to play, and that's what he and I do when we when we see each other especially, and, in, and I guess you got a taste for it here. I hope it wasn't too offensive for anyone it's just Gilbert and it's me with Gilbert and he's got two beautiful kids and an amazing, beautiful wife. And, uh, you want to listen to his podcast. It's colossal. It's amazing. And just, uh, you know, just go up and, and look it up. And he also does cameos, which he likes to do. And you'll see him, you know, forever on many, many things. Cause there's only one Gilbert Gottfried. Um, and I just, I love the guy. And I hope you enjoyed this craziness, this immature uh, craziness with references from the 60s and 50s and 40s and James Cagney references. Um, So thank you guys for listening or for watching on YouTube. If you're there, you got to see, you know, some some of the uh, weirdness of me uh, laughing and crying uncontrollably, which I'll be doing again when I sign off. So do what you do. You know what you do. You subscribe. You can download this podcast, which is great. Uh, Rate, review, subscribe, uh, follow, depending on how you listen to it. I'll call you guys sometime. There's a phone number up there. You can call and leave a message, and I'll call you at specific times, check in, see how you're doing. Um, And I'm just sending you all my best, you know. Uh, This is a year we're going to climb out of together, and I'm happy to be doing this. I hope it brings some entertainment. And um, helps you through your day a little bit. Uh, Sending you lots of love. All right? I don't care. I'm not shy about giving out love because that's what I got in my heart. People are cynical about it, you know? The Beatles said, all you need is love. That would be like, yeah, right. How can I love all the people I hate? So maybe try to hate a few less people today. I don't know. It's the uh, dad in me or maybe the peacemaker or maybe just someone of reason trying to hope that we can uh, get through this time. All the best and uh, have a good rest of your day or night.